it, oh Lord. Without you, Jesus, we are nothing, oh God. Oh, my sovereign Lord. Let us 
love on one another though the way that you love me oh Jesus oh Let's just keep worshiping because I'm seeing a liquid glory honey falling down on you right now. And some of you just need, you got some wounds that need to be healed. And you need to just tell the Lord, yes. Yes, Lord. Just tell him yes. Because the glory of the Lord is falling down like liquid honey right now. I'm telling you. It's everywhere. And some of you need to drink it. Some of you need to eat it. Some of you need to apply it to the wounds that are inside of you. Oh, Jesus. Lord, we just accept your, your glory. We accept your presence. We say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. If you pray in other tongues, pray in other tongues. If you don't pray in other tongues and you want to pray in other tongues, now's a good time to go ahead and open your mouth. Beloved, the Lord wants to remind you that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You can come to the throne. You can partake of the honey. You can partake of the glory. For there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And the Lord says, I do not hold you back. You hold yourself back. Allow me to remove the chains. 
Allow me to remove the burden. Allow me to remove the weight. For I call you to come on to me, the Lord says. I beckon you to come on to me. Come, my son. Come, my daughter. Come, my child. For I, the Lord, wait for you and you alone. I wait for you and for you alone. For I made you and formed you in your mother's womb. And I knew you before that. And I will know you for an eternity, saith the Lord. I will know you for an eternity. I will know you for an eternity. Oh, Jesus. Bless them, church. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, bless him. He's here. Hallelujah. We honor you, Father. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. We give it all to you. Hallelujah. We lift up our voice Hallelujah. to honor. Our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Lord. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. We honor you. Come on, honor him. Don't hold back. Honor him. We honor you, Lord.
Let me tell you, hold on a second. Let me tell you, uh, tell you what I'm seeing and what the Lord's telling me. I'm seeing several angels, very large angels with their hands outstretched in worship. And I was asking the Lord, what is that? And he said, tell my people that tonight is a night of angelic assignment. He says, tonight's a night of angelic assignment that I am willing and able to assign angels to those who want them. But here's the deal. I said, Lord, I don't see a sword. I don't see, I just see them with their hands raised up, almost in a salute. Both hands are raised up. I said, Lord, what is it? And he says, let my people know that the angels that are assigned tonight for those that want them are angels of worship. And he says, and if this is how they work, listen very carefully. This is how they work. He says, you're not going to send these angels out to do things. He says, here's what the deal is. He says, wherever they're at, at home, at church, or wherever they're at, if they begin to worship me, this angel of worship will immediately join them. And my word says that where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. He says, it will be an increase of worship in their lives if they will take this assignment of angelic worship. So I'm telling you, if this is something that you feel, I've never said this word before, then just tell the Lord, I'll take one, Lord. Let me have one, let me have two, let me have whatever it is. But when I start to worship the Lord, and listen, if it happens this week, you need to let us know Sunday. But if you start to worship the Lord, you should feel an increase of His presence and an immediate speeding up of spiritual things when you start to worship him i'm not talking prayer i'm talking about singing to him a new song singing to him those things he's saying i will assign an angel to join you in your worship he says if you only ask me tonight lord let it be let it be god let it be lord hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you what I see. I see angels immediately just jumping into people right now. Just jumping on assignments. You need to tell them. Tell them right now. Come here, angel. I want an angel. Just tell them. Come on. I see them jumping. Jumping from the back to the front. Jumping on people. Joining you right now. Oh, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. Come on, let's sing hallelujah to him just a little. Hallelujah. Come on, let the angels join. Bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Why don't we get out of our seats and why don't we say hello to somebody?
Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord one more time. Well, listen, my wife was so disappointed in me. Say she was, say disappointed. Yeah, she was disappointed in me. And you're going to say, what possibly could you have done, Pastor, to disappoint your wife? Well, you must know. Um, I had intended to start what I called the Red Letter Series tonight. Um, and I had talked to you about that on Sunday. And um, what the Red Letter Series is going to be is that we're going to talk and preach on nothing but the red letters in the Bible, which is what, what Jesus said, right? And I was, I, that was my intent and everything else, and we're still going in that direction. But God said, before I do that, I have to remind you. I said, what do you mean remind them? He said, remind me of what? He says, you need to remind them of who they are. Now, this is why. He said, if you start talking to them in the condition they're in about me, they're going to segregate themselves from me and them. They're going to say, but that was Jesus, and this is me. He says, they need to know who they are. They just need a small reminder of who they are so that when they see what I said and what I did and the, and the situations I was in, they realize that I am in them, and they can do the same things. Somebody say same things. So what God says is tonight you're actually going to get a reminder because the truth is most Christians that I come across today don't fully understand who they are in Christ. Come on. If you talk to them, this, this is a conversation that was actually today. If you talk to some Christians, what their thought is, when God says, I supply everything you possibly could need, their thought is, but we need to be satisfied with whatever God gives us. Did you hear what I said? But we need to be satisfied with whatever God gives us. Can I, can I just tell you that that's not biblical? Go ahead, start stoning me if you want to. I bet you the stones don't hit me. What God is saying today is that we have a false doctrine of humility, a false humility, because we say we have to be satisfied with whatever God gives us, and we walk in poverty, and we walk in lack, and we walk even in spiritual poverty. And what God is saying is that, no, 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 you should be thankful but never satisfied. He says, I'm looking for those that will seek after me. I'm looking for those that will go after me. I'm looking for those that seek and walk and go after my spirit. I'm not looking for those that are happy with goosebumps. I'm not looking for those that are happy to see other people get healed. I'm not looking for those that are happy to see somebody else cast out devils. God says, I'm looking for those who will do everything that my son did and more. Because my son has gone to the Father. 
to myself. Most Christians don't fully understand who they are, and it's a powerful key to breakthrough. See, you're not just an old forgiven sinner. What you need to see is what your father in heaven says about you, not what the pastor says about you. Not what an elder says about you. Not what a brother or sister in Christ says about you. Not what a husband says about you or a wife says about you. Not even what your parents say about you or or your children say about you or your neighbors say about you or anyone else says about you. What matters is what Father says about you. Let man say whatever they're going to say. But it's what my Father says. Seriously, there's one truth, and that's the Father's truth. It is the living word of God. It is the gospel. John 8, 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You've heard that over and over again. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is opposite of the truth, beloved? Deception. Lies. Does that make sense? So if the truth sets you free, then what do you think deception does? Come on, what does it do to you? It binds you. It puts you into bondage. So if the truth sets you free and you have to know the truth so you can be set free, then if you're told lies and you believe in the deception, then what happens? You go into bondage. I go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were told you can eat of anything of the garden except that one tree. God says, what happened? You'll die. They knew the truth. And they were free to walk with God in the garden. But what happened? The devil came in. That serpent of old came in and he said, did God really say? Is that what God really meant? Did he really mean that? And the second Eve said, the Bible says, saw, meaning with her mind, that the fruit was good to eat, is when sin came in. You see, she had truth to walk with God Almighty in the garden. And there was such innocence that she could walk around completely unclothed with Adam and Eve. There was such innocence. It was like if children were doing it. And it was no big deal. And they walked with God and they was talking with God. I mean, come on, how many of you want that? They were free. But the second the deception came in. Mankind was put in bondage from that point forward, right? Listen, if you see yourself as a failure, you won't be able to exercise your authority in Christ. Even after the blood has made you worthy, if you claim to be unworthy after the blood of Christ has made you worthy, then you are actually denying the finished work of Christ. You're actually agreeing with hell and not heaven. Every time a spirit of condemnation comes upon you, you're agreeing with hell and not heaven. Why do I say that? Because the word says, therefore there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Well, mate, I just sinned, pastor. I just committed adultery. I just took drugs. I just did this. I did that. It does not matter because you're in Christ. You're in Christ. It says nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. I want you to say this. I am worthy. Come on, say it like you mean it. I am worthy. Because Jesus' blood has made me worthy. Let me give you some points today. I want to remind you of who you are in Christ. Because then you're going to understand as we start the Red Letter series that you are the same things that He is because of who you are and because of who He is. You want to know the first thing? Believe it or not, whether you feel like it or not, you are an object of love. Say object of love. You're loved by the Father not because of what you've done, no, but because what the Father has done in you. Because of what God the Father has done in you, it makes you who you are. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. It's true, beloved. 
God loves us with the same love that he has for Jesus. And listen, if you do not realize the love of God, listen to what I'm about to say. If you do not have a understanding in your spirit, if you do not realize the love of God towards you, you cannot be filled with the fullness of God. Did you hear what I said? If you don't understand the love of God, you can't be filled with the fullness of God. How many of you want the fullness of God? Okay. Do you understand what the fullness is? Before we get into the fullness, what is it? What, what do you mean? How can I say that statement? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, 17, 18, and 19. It says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So where does Christ want to dwell? In our hearts. Okay. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with what? All the fullness of God. You can't be filled with the fullness of God until you realize the love of God. You can't mix law with grace. Because a little bit of yeast ruins the whole batch. You can't put judgment with grace. Judgment is for the unsaved. Tribulation is for the saved. You can't even, listen, when people make mistakes, you can't even condemn them if they confess Jesus Christ. You're supposed to restore them. Not condemn them. But listen, until you know the love of God, you can never be filled with the fullness of God. And I don't know about you, but I want the fullness of God in my life. I want the fullness of God in my family. I want the fullness of God in this church. And the only way that's going to happen is if we understand the love of God, which knows no bounds. That's what Ephesians says. I can't know the fullness of his spirit. I can't know the fullness of his glory. I can't know the fullness of his presence until I understand the love that he has, not only for me, but for my brothers and sisters, even the brothers and sisters that have offended me, even the brothers and sisters that have talked against me. It doesn't matter because when I understand the love of God and I understand that I can never have his fullness until I am filled, what? With his love. Then and only then, then and only then can I experience him in his glory. Listen, my beloved, you need to understand something. If Living Word Church is going to go through a revival, there has to be an understanding of the love of God. And the love of God just coming to us is not enough. It has to be the love of God going to others equally. How many of you like to be loved by God? Yeah, I thought everybody had their hand up. Now, how many of you know that we seem to have a problem loving somebody else as much as we want God to love us? Yeah, we got some honest people here. What happens is we get caught up in what they have not done. We get caught up in what they have done or have not done or, or how they look or what they dress or, or you know, how they sing or how they preach. Or, listen, I'm telling you, we can't have the fullness of God until we have an understanding of the love of God, that he loves you. It's crazy about you. Did you know that? you know that Abigail he's crazy about you girl he's like the best boyfriend you could ever ask for he brings roses like all the time his presence right now his presence just all over you all over you hallelujah because you don't understand the love you'll never get the fullness those of you that are married that have fullness in your marriage, it's because you understand the love. When the marriage is not full, what's the matter? Probably communication on the love. Come on, somebody say amen. So the first thing is you're an object of love. 
Man, some of you just like to need to like sit down and tell the Lord, Lord, would you just love on me right now? And just feel his presence, man. There's sometimes I've been rocking on that rocking chair or I'm in my study and I just say, Lord, would you just love on me right now? I really feel like I could use a little love and boom, it's like he's pouring out a bucket of oil, man. It's just there. We just feel his presence. You can feel, let me explain something to you. Because you are in the earth but not of it, because you're presently seated with Christ in the heavens, you can physically feel your father come and put his arms around you if you let him. Let your faith grab a hold of that. It's not just out there somewhere when I die one day. You can physically, physically feel your father in heaven come and wrap his arms around you if you allow him. I'm telling you. How many of you want to feel the Lord? Listen, I want a burning bush experience like every day. Come on. Don't you want that? Anybody else want a burning bush? I want to see the Red Sea parted every day with people getting delivered all the time. I want to see people popping up out of wheelchairs. I want to see blind eyes opening, deaf ears opening. I want to see that every day. I want to see the youth so on fire for God that they literally laugh when they're offered drugs or alcohol or cigarettes or, or watching something they shouldn't. That they're literally laughing because they're like, that is nothing compared to the God I serve. I want to see parents like that. I want to see grandparents like that. I want to see this church like that. That we laugh at what the world offers because what the world offers is fleeting and passing and will just burn away one day. But what he offers is tangible. You know what tangible means? It means that if the presence of God is like right here, I can go over to Leanna and touch her and she can feel the presence of God because it's tangible. It's manifested from heaven onto earth. On earth as it is in heaven. Come on, it's just Bible. We need to start believing, church. We need to know who we are. You know, we're an object of his love. And why are we an object of his love? Because we're justified and we're declared innocent. Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The problem in the church today is we mix the law with grace and we think that we have the right to judge. We do have the right to judge actions. You're right. But you don't have the right to judge saints. Did you hear what I said? If the person confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you have no right to judge them. Because God doesn't even judge them until the great white throne. Come on. How many of you know that it's liberating to know that nobody in the church can judge you? Does that feel good? Nobody in the church can judge you. If that feels good, raise your hand. That's nice. Okay? Nobody in the church can judge you, right? Guess what? That means you can't judge them either. Come on. You can't judge them either because God ultimately is the judge. And when we understand this, we have such great freedom. And why do we have freedom? Because we're no longer under the law. We're under grace. And under the law, it condemns us because guess what? We're going to break the law, aren't we? I tell you what, it's literally like you never sinned. Talk about freedom, man. It's like you never sinned. It's not the law, it's not the flesh, it's by faith, it's belief in the freedom like you never sinned. And this is what's so great, it leads me to my third point. Because I'm an object of his love, because I'm under grace, I'm entitled to a clean conscience. Did you hear what I said? I'm entitled to a clean, my wife always says, how do you go to sleep so quickly? It says, because I have a clean conscience. She says, no, you have no conscience. I said, no, I have a clean conscience because my God says that nothing is held against me. Come on. Since our sins have been put away and removed from us, we're justified. That means we're made right with God and I am entitled, you are entitled to an undefiled, clean conscience. 
There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, remember? You know what condemnation is? It's bad conscience. If there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who's in Christ Jesus? Those that claim by faith to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Confessions made what? With the mouth. Okay? In the heart, but through the mouth. So if I confess that I'm, G- I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm saved, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord, then I have to have a clean conscience. Why? Because that's what it says in the Word. Hebrews 9, 14. This is powerful. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I'm not making this up. It's in the word. You're supposed to have a clear conscience. You're not supposed to stand there in condemnation or sit there in condemnation. You're not going to sit there and say the Lord doesn't love me. You're not going to sit there and say the Lord doesn't want to do anything for me. That is agreement with the pit of hell. The Bible says right there in Hebrews 9.14 that it should purge your conscience from dead works. You know what dead works is? They're dead. They're dead. They have no... How, how much power does a dead person have over you? You know, it's funny. It's silent. Like, okay, you're being silly. But this is the way we're living. You know who the old Jesse is? He's dead. How much power does the old Jesse have on me? Nothing except what I allow him to have. He's dead. Why are we still beating ourselves up? Why are we still be- why are we denying the finished work? Your conscience can be purged. Some of you are sitting there, you've accepted Jesus into your life, you've confessed him as Lord and Master, and still you're condemned when you see a bottle of alcohol. Still you're condemned when you drive by an old uh, an old uh, bar that you used to go to. You're condemned because you bumped into an old girlfriend or boyfriend. You're condemned because of all the things you did, but God says If he calls you clean and he calls you righteous, then anything, even your memories, are just lies. Because God calls you clean. God calls you righteous. Do you you understand what I mean by that? Even your memories are lies. I did that. Stop saying that. But pastor, I did this. Stop saying it. What does he say? He says, I grab all of your sins and I throw them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to bring them up again. Listen, this is no cult. This is scripture. You must understand who you are in Christ and stop walking with condemnation. I don't care if you had you did something last night. I don't care if you did something this morning. I don't care if you did something on the way to church. I'm telling you, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And you say, but, but, but pastor, what about us that just continue to sin? Oh, let me tell you, if you continue to sin, eventually you'll remove yourself from the covering of the Lord. That's the danger. I'm not saying that, you know, Romans says that where sin abounds, grace abounds more abundantly. But Paul says, don't go and say, I'm going to go sin more then so I can have more grace. Hallelujah. He says, there's one cross. There's one Calvary. Beloved, this is not a, this is not a free ticket to go and sin and commit adultery or, or a fornication. or This is not a free ticket to go and do whatever you've been doing or thinking about doing or giving in to that lust or giving in to whatever it is. That's not what I'm saying today. What I'm saying today is that God forgives you. And He not only forgives you for what you've done, but He forgives you knowing what you're going to do tomorrow. But here's the trick. If I sit there and I commit adultery and I get away with it and then I go and I do it again and I get away with it and I go and I do it again because I keep getting away with it and because the pastor keeps saying, oh, God loves me. 
Oh, I gotta just get, I could get away with it. God loves me. That's not what we're saying today because what's gonna happen is what happens in Romans. It says that what happens is that you, God gives you a way to a depraved mind and you start to invent ways of doing evil. And suddenly you pull yourself away from the one, the, the alpha, the omega, the, the king. You pull yourself away from him because suddenly your lust and all these other things seem better than he is. And you walk away. So don't think you can just go out and do this. Every time you go out, you play with fire. But don't let the devil say, now that you've done it, you can never go back to church. Because that's not Bible. I'm telling you, even memories are lies. The fourth thing is sin, your sins are no longer a part of you. The truth is that your sins have been completely not covered, but removed from you. It's not possible in the Old Testament, but through the blood. Somebody say the blood. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 17. Hebrews 10, 17 says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. God, God is so good, folks. We don't understand this. You want to know why? Because let's say I used to drink a lot, okay? Let's say I suddenly just have a bad day after 20 years of not drinking, and I say, you know what? I'm going to go, and I'm going to buy me a 12-pack, and I'm going to go sit on my porch, and I'm going to go get drunk. I just lost my job. My wife's leaving me, whatever the excuse is. And I sit there, and I just start drinking, and I start drinking, and I start drinking. Hmm. And then when I come out of this buzz... I say, God, I'm sorry. I had a weak spot. I had a weak moment. It says in Hebrews 10, 17 that he takes my sins. He takes my iniquities. You know what that is, right? The offenses that I gave toward him on purpose. You know, like when you yell at him because things aren't going your way with your wife, your husband, your children, your job, whatever your excuse was, your iniquities. I know he doesn't like this, but I'm doing it anyway. Come on. And this is what he talks about. I, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. I'm telling you that he doesn't want to remember our failures. He wants to see us as his precious child that is blameless in his sight. So what he does is he forgets our sins. He forgets our iniquities for his own sake. He chooses to do it for his own sake. And when we understand this, it brings me to the next point. We have peace. We have peace with the Father. Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we've been justified and made right with God, we have peace. Peace that allows us to sleep at night. Peace that allows us to forgive others. Peace that allows us to forgive ourselves. Peace that allows us to trust our Father in all things. Peace that allows us to overcome the world. Because we have a peace... That surpasses all understanding. Number six, we're clothed in righteousness. Let me tell you something. There's a great exchange that happens, my brothers and sisters. When we put our sins on him, he puts a robe of righteousness on us. There is no closer friend. There is no greater God. We get all of our sins, all of our filth, and we put it on him on the cross. And he in turn hands us a white robe of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I got to tell you something before I read that. I, I used to say it all the time and I still hear people say it. Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That is so devastating to your faith. You are no longer a sinner. You're a saint. When you look at Ephesians, when you look at Galatians, when you look at Colossians, when you look at all this, is to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Corinthians, to the saints here, to the saints there, it's always saints, it's always grace. Never, never does the, does the writer address to the sinners in Ephesus. To those poor old sinners saved by grace in Corinthians. Never does he do that. He always calls them saints. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new. Say new. 
He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you become a new creature. In fact, Ephesians 4.24 says that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. What is the new man created in? Righteousness and holiness. Now, how many of you know that when you accept Jesus Christ, you're a new man, right? It says you're a new creature, right? So what are you? You are righteous and you're holy. You know what the problem is? is if I sat here and said, you know what, who are you? You'd sit there and say, well, I'm a manager at a dental business, or I'm a drummer, or I do this, I do that. That's not what God's looking for, and that's not what I'm looking for anymore. When I say, who are you, we're saying, I am holiness, I am righteousness, I am a son and daughter of the Most High God, that's who I am. I am the healer because the healer is inside of me. I am deliverer because the deliverer is inside of me. I am the good news because the good news is inside of me. Not what you do in the world. God's not interested in what you do in the world unless it's doing his kingdom work. Oh, I love this. You ready? It says to put on a new man, right? Righteousness and holiness. Let me make it real clear. God gave me this. I like it. You ready? Say, I'm ready. This is good. It really is if you'll let it sink in. Ready? God didn't repair Jesse he made a new one God didn't repair you he's not in the process of repairing you he made a new one of you how can I say that what do I mean I'm sorry is it not being called born again He doesn't, he's not in the midst of repairing you. You're in the midst of becoming more like him. But you've already been not repaired. You've been made new. And we don't understand that. Because we'd rather believe in the memories of the things we did in our sin and in our darkness and in our ignorance. Than believe in what God says about us. He didn't repair me. He made a new me. I put off the old man. He's died. He's passed away. The new creature has come forward. And now I live on the renewing of my mind, either based on what I remember myself doing, even if it was yesterday, or who God says I am. He didn't repair us. He created a new one of us. It's a new man. It's a new creature. And he says, I got those sins, I got those iniquities, and I threw them never to remember them again. It's all new. I'm telling you, when I go to God in heaven one day, and I say, Lord, remember what I did when I was 17 or 18? I'm really sorry for that. He's going to say, Jess, I don't remember that. Because you got saved just before your 21st birthday. Talk to me about that day in February where you got saved. I remember all those days. I remember the iniquities. I remember the mistakes. And I remember my grace that was renewed every morning. I remember all the good things that you did for me and my kingdom. I remember your heart going after me. I remember your heart trying to get more of me. He says, but if you ask me when you were 17 or 18, when you ask me even when you were four years old, I don't remember. Because my word says, and I'm faithful to my word, that I threw it all into the sea of forgetfulness. He didn't repair me. He let me start over. And he did the same for you. And he did the same for me. I got to start over. Why in the world would I go back to what I did before? When somebody gave me the ability to start over. Ephesians 2.6 says, And he has raised us up together and made us sit 
together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Give me a couple of more minutes because I'm about to stretch you. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Many in the church don't realize what this says. It refers to authority, right? Because of our position in Christ through the finished work of Calvary, we are sit seated in a place of authority when it comes to sickness, disease, and demons. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay. Why does it say seated? See, many of us don't understand this because many of, us, many of us are not warriors. But the warriors should immediately understand, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's seated? You don't sit down in a battle, do you? You don't sit down in a struggle, do you? You don't sit down when there's a war to fight, do you? When do you sit down? When it's over. Now, where are you in Christ? You're seated with Christ. Christ and Christ. You are seated, which means what? We're talking about authority, but you're seated. And what does it mean? That means there's no battle and there's no struggle. True authority is shown when you only have to speak and you're not having to do actions. A king is a king of his kingdom and in control of his kingdom when he only has to speak from his throne and he doesn't have to put his armor on to go fight for his kingdom. Come on. So if we're seated in heavenly places and we're seated with Christ, that means that there should be no battle, there should be no struggle, simply words that are in agreement with our Father. Come on, are you hearing me? You ready for some stretching? Say, I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to stretch you now. Revelation 5.10. Revelation 5.10 says, He has made us unto our God kings and priests. Some scriptures say kingdom priests, okay? But it says on the second part, And we shall reign on the earth. Now, some people say, well, that's Revelation 5, and we don't really know if that's like literal or if that's like uh, figuratively and... We don't really know if that's like before the rapture or after the rapture or in the middle of the rapture. You could go all that way, but I'll go back to Genesis where he told them to take, have a dominion over everything, even the creepy crawly things, okay? So if Jesus has restored, if Jesus is the last Adam, like I preached on Sunday, and he has restored the fallen nature, the fallen man, then I'm telling you that we're to reign while we're here on earth. Now the truth is, are you ready? Here comes the stretching. You don't need to ask God to heal somebody. Yeah, you can throw stones. I bet you they won't hit me. We sit there and we plead with God, would you heal this person? And we're not supposed to be doing that. We can speak with authority over that sickness and command it to flee in Jesus' name. We can command those broken bones to mend in Jesus' name. We can command because we're seated with Christ in authority. Now, don't go and get religious on me and tune me out. Listen to what I'm saying. The standard practice in the early church was when they were followers of Christ was to go out and heal the sick. That's what the word says. The same is true when we come to demons. We don't need to ask God to remove demons from people. But instead, we take up the authority Jesus gave to us. Listen, the disciples of the early church never asked the Father to heal the sick or cast out demons. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You say, but yes, they did. No. Listen to what I'm about to say. In their prayer time, they would ask the Lord for boldness. In their prayer time, they would ask their Lord, the Lord for understanding. In their prayer time, they would ask for things from their father. But when they went out on the streets, they would cast out demons. They would heal the sick. They would cleanse the lepers. They would do all these things in the name of Jesus with the boldness that they had asked the father for. 
Beloved, we come here and we plead, oh Lord, oh Lord, would you heal this person? Would you lead this person to you, oh God? And he said, I'm not willing that any perish, but I'll come to repentance. Would you heal this person? And he says, I've, by my stripes upon my back, I've taken all your sickness and all your disease. Would you, would you take the demons out of this person? And he says, just simply speak. I've given the power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All means sickness. All means disease. All means possession and oppression. and All, all means all. And we have to understand something. We need to go out and do and trust God that if we're doing it in the name of Jesus, it's going to be done. You know what it is? We pray and we kind of ask God, do you want to heal this one? Do you want to cast out a devil of this one? Do, I, do you want me to pray for that one to get saved? I mean, they look pretty rough there, Lord. And we sit there and we kind of, which one do you want to do? Listen, my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. What the early disciples said is they said, in Jesus' name, be healed. What they said was rise up and walk. They didn't sit there, oh God, do you want this, this, this paralyzed person to rise up? They said, rise up, silver and gold, I have none. But what I do have, I give you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up, take your bed and walk. You didn't see them pleading to God, would you please, would you please, would you please? All the pleading was done in the prayer time, in the private time, in the closet time. All that pleading was done over there alone when, when Jesus would go by himself. But when it was time to address things, he didn't sit there and ask the Lord, Oh Lord, would you? He simply said, Be healed. Rise up. Walk. We must realize our position on earth. We must realize our seated authority in heaven. We must realize that because we're seated in Christ in heaven, there's no struggles and there's no battles. We must realize the commission that he's put on us, and we must realize the Father's heart. It's to heal, it's to deliver, and it's to save. When we don't realize who we are in Christ, our faith is crippled. If you don't feel worthy to exercise your authority in Christ, then you won't be walking in the fullness of the faith. Satan works constantly, diligently to program people's minds to make you feel unworthy, to make you feel condemned, to make you feel like you're unable to walk in the power that others walk in. And this is one of the most powerful strongholds in existence today. Satan says, did God really say do you know what happened with Jesus? And I don't want to jump ahead too much, but what happened to Jesus in the desert, beloved? He had just come from being water baptized, remember? Forty days before he had been water baptized, it said that the heavens opened and everyone heard the audible voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. What else did he say? In whom I am well pleased. And everybody says, hallelujah. Wow, that's awesome. But let me explain something to you. Forty days later, Satan is in the desert telling Jesus, if you're truly the Son of God, if God really said that just 40 days ago in front of witnesses and multitudes, if you truly are the Son of God, turn these rocks into bread. He's given the same thing over and over from Adam and Eve to Jesus in the desert. And I guarantee you to you and to me in the middle of the night, did God really say, did you really experience God? Did the pastor actually have a word for you today? Are you really healed when Cliff laid his hands on you or when pastor or elders laid hands on you? Did, did that devil really come out? Did you actually see somebody with blind eyes open or deaf ears? Did, does the pastor actually send money to Pakistan for orphans? I mean, let's just go down the list. He goes and he questions us and he questions us and he questions us. He questions you in your marriage. He questions you with your children. He questions you with your ministry. He questions you with all these things. And God all the time said, this is my beloved child. I love you, I love you, I love you, and I want to touch you and love you, and I want to assign angels to you. I want my Holy Spirit to be on you. And then literally minutes later, an hour later, another day later, we sit there and say, did God really say that? It's not us saying it. It's Him saying it to us. You are a daughter of the Most High God. You are. No one can take that away from you. You are a son. 
of the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're more than an overcomer. You're a conqueror. You can and will cast out devils in Jesus' name. I don't care if it's the devil himself. In the name of Jesus, he must go. And if it's a cancer or if it's a cold, it's got to go in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter. When we come to that identity in Christ, then, then we'll have the fullness that he's called us to. If I say I'm unworthy, when the blood says I am worthy, then I'm denying the finished work of the cross. And I'm speaking against my Father who loves me. And I'm in agreement with the one who wants to destroy me. Beloved, I'm tired of being a pawn of the devil. I'm tired of giving into thoughts that I know I shouldn't be giving into. I'm tired of giving into thoughts that are contrary to the Word of God. I'm tired of walking in manhood instead of walking in sainthood. Because it's the saint of God that does all the things of God, not man. These hands don't heal the sick. But when I say in the name of Jesus, these hands heal the sick. These hands can't battle the devil. But when I say in the name of Jesus, these hands can cast out any devil. These hands can't lead anybody to Christ. But when I tell them about Jesus, they're going to come to Christ. See, we're walking after the flesh and not after the spirit because we don't know who we are in the spirit. We allow our memories of our old self, memories of what we've done to each other, memories of what we've said to each other, memories of things old and passed away, literally in the sea of forgetfulness, we allow those things to dictate to us what we are in life. Well, let me tell you something. The world says what you are is based on the car you drive, the house you live in, and the numbers in your bank account. God says none of those things matter. I'm going to close with this. I'm reminded of the rich young ruler that wanted to serve God. And he said, great. Go give and sell all your things to the poor. And he walked away from what God had because he had a lot of stuff and he couldn't give it up. You know, I hear that story and a lot of times what we do is we sit there and say, yeah, you know, that's, that's a rough one. Yeah, that's a rough one, you know, giving up our stuff. I don't think God would ask us to do that. It's the first thing that comes out of my, our mouths. But you know what we forget? God did not tell him no. He said no. He said, fine. You want to be a disciple? God saw the potential in this young man. He saw that he could be a disciple. And he said, go sell your stuff, give it away, do whatever you got to do, and then come jump join. He didn't say no. The young man said no. Beloved, I'm telling you now, you're sitting there wondering, can God really use me? God will not say no to any of you. It's you that say no to him. With whatever decisions you make in life, whatever you prioritize in your life, it's you that says no to him. I won't forgive. I won't forget. I won't pray for somebody who has demons because that's icky. I won't pray for a certain type of sickness because, you know, it may be contagious. I won't pray for that brother or sister because they're coughing and they touch their hands. And what if I touch them, I may get sick. 
I won't go down and, and do the homeless. Uh, I won't go do that because they have demons. And, and I've seen them walk up to Pastor Jesse while he's preaching, growling at him. I mean, I'm not going to do any of that. We say no all the time. It's time to start saying yes. Would you stand to your feet? Close your eyes. I want you to repeat after me. I am a son and daughter of the Most High. I am a believer. I am a healer in Jesus' name. I am a deliverer in Jesus' name. I am a tither in Jesus' name. I am an offerer in Jesus' name. I am a worshiper in Jesus' name. Y'all want you to say this. I believe that I am all these things and all the things that the Bible says about me. But more importantly, I believe that my Father believes this about me and I will act upon all the promises and all the scripture that my father says about me in Jesus name amen now I know it's late I want you to find a partner real quick come on find a partner find a partner yeah your husbands and wives got it quick right I saw you, Joe. I saw you. Johnny, too. He's all like, come here, honey. Come on, let's get some partners. Everybody got a partner? If you don't have a partner, raise your hand. <laughs> Face your partner. Yes, it's going to get a little uncomfortable. Hallelujah. Grab your partner's hands. Come on. This is going to be beautiful. All right. You all wiped your hands off and everything now? All right. I want you to look at your partner. I want one of you, uh, one of you say one and the other one say two. Okay. I already got it. All right. All the ones are going to speak first. I want the ones to say this. Ready? Look them in the eye and tell them, you are everything that our Father says you are. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now all the twos say after me, you are everything that our Father says you are. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You know what you just did, right? You've spoken to that person's life in agreement with the creator of life. The same one that created heaven and earth just created something in your spirits. For greater is he that is within you than he of this world. Amen? Will you please stop agreeing with the devil? Okay? Let's just stop agreeing with the devil. Let's stop agreeing with him in every aspect of our life. Let's actually open our Bibles, read our word, and discuss it with one another. And bless each other. You know what I read today? I read I'm the head and not the tail. That means you're the head and not the tail. You know what I read today? No weapon formed against me will prosper. You know what that means? That no weapon formed against you or me will prosper. Why? Because our Father says no. Sister Yolanda, did you read any scripture today? What did you read? Okay, good. You were practicing this. This is good. Read it. Read it. 
I read Psalm 34, 19. It says that the righteous person comes to trouble. But the Lord, the Lord comes and takes care of it each time. Imagine how much better that is. And man, somebody tried to cut me off on the highway today. Oh man, I had to, I had to really scrape and borrow money to eat lunch. Oh, I felt sick all day. I felt nauseous all day. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to get to sleep tonight because I haven't slept in the past few nights. I don't know if my wife's going to be nice to me. I don't know if my husband's going to be nice to me. I don't know if my kid even went to school today. Never mind. He said he was going to school. I just realized it's summer. He shouldn't be in school. I've got a problem. And then we come to church like this. <sighs> Is, am I telling the truth? That's the way we talk. Instead of saying, you know what I read? That the Lord says that we're righteous, and because we're righteous, that no matter what we suffer, man, it's going to be okay. I say let's get rid of the stinking thinking, and let's start thinking like sons and daughters of the Most High God. You want to know why? Because when I get into this Red Letter series, you need to see yourself doing what Jesus did. And you can't do that if you don't think you're worthy. But you are. Amen? Amen? Raise your hands. Father, I just bless everyone here in the name of Jesus Christ with a renewed mind, with an increase in the spirit. I speak freedom in the name of Jesus over them, Lord. That every word that was spoken over them, Lord, every scripture that was given today, even when they looked hand in hand and those next to them or in front of them, in the name of Jesus, I speak freedom, freedom, freedom from this world. And I speak the kingdom of God manifested in their lives today, right now, from this moment forward. Dreams, visions, and prophecy I release unto you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless somebody before you leave. Let me go ahead and uh, did everybody get a chance to give your tithes and offerings? I'm sorry, we're going to bless the tithes and offerings. In the day we live in, we need to bless and speak multiplication to the tithes and offerings. Amen? But listen, in the day we live in, God's telling me that he's going to put the Christians as suppliers to the unsaved. So, stretch your hands toward this. This represents you, beloved. We call you partners for a reason. Father, we speak over these tithes and offerings, and I command multiplication right now in the name of Jesus for every household that is represented here, whether they gave today or another day or they were unable to give. I speak multiplication. I speak grace. I speak mercy. I speak love. I speak compassion. I speak increase in the name of Jesus. I ask, Father, for increase, 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 promotion, Lord, promotion, Father, promotion, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen and amen.